Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Crazy Money. I am your host, Paul Ollinger. My guest this week is legendary Hollywood talent manager, Larry Thompson. Larry is also the author of a book called Shine, a powerful four-step plan for becoming a star in anything that you do. And if there's anybody who knows about helping people become stars, it is Larry Thompson. Over the course of a five-decade career in movies and music, Larry has guided the careers of over 200 stars, including William Shatner, Drew Barrymore, David Hasselhoff, Sonny and Cher, Barry White, Cindy Crawford. Any of these names ring a bell? I think they do because they're all super famous and Larry was a big part of their journeys. Not bad for a young guy from Clarksdale, Mississippi, who had a dream to make it in the entertainment business. So after graduating from Ole Miss Law School, Larry tore ass across the country and arrived at Los Angeles and got his career started, a career that has generated incredible anecdotes and stories that he shares with us on this episode of Crazy Money. I'll, I'll do a spoiler on one of them. As a young attorney at Capitol Records, he helped negotiate the breakup of the Beatles, then sign each of those guys to individual solo contracts. That's the level Larry has played at. Uh, he also goes deep on, on on what it takes to be a star, what it takes to be co- to to maintain stardom, what it takes to uh, avoid the pitfalls of Hollywood, both for his clients and for himself. And I want to say thank you to Larry for sharing these insights and for being vulnerable and sharing some of the the ups and downs of his personal journey. I also want to say thank you to my friend and neighbor Steve Chamberlain, who's a good friend of Larry's from way back. Uh, he connected me with Larry. I thought he'd be a great crazy money guest, and I think he was totally right. I know you're going to enjoy hearing Larry's story, Larry's stories every bit as much as I did. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Larry Thompson. Larry, it's good to see you again. Hey, same here, Paul. How's 2023 starting off for you? Well, okay. Compared to 22, we're all right. Good, good. Larry, it's funny, you know, uh, I'm just curious, uh, how does a kid get from Clarksdale, Mississippi, all the way to Hollywood? Well, my mom used to say to me, Larry, when you graduate, you got to get out of this town because there's nothing but a graveyard with streetlights. She says, I don't want you standing in that grocery store on your feet all day like your dad. I want you to go out to Hollywood and meet those important people so that you have a future. And how did you make that happen? There wasn't some established path from Clarksdale to to the big time, to the movie studios back in the day. No, I mean, my mom continued to uh, prompt me. You know, she says, Larry, I went up to Memphis and I went to Goldsmiths and I bought me a red dress and I put it in a box and I put it under the bed and I'm not wearing that dress until you invite me to Hollywood for me to see you win an Academy Award. So with that monkey on my back and a chicken bone in my throat, I was constantly motivated. And, and, and lucky for me, I had the same interest uh, in music and television and features and stars as she did. But she used to read Photoplay magazine and look at all the pictures of the big celebrities of the day, Elizabeth Taylor, whomever it was, and say, see these people, they're important. I want you to go out to Hollywood and meet them. So when I graduated law school, Ole Miss, I got in my car, Black Oldsmobile with maroon interior, with $700, and I put all my clothes on back on a rack uh, and I drove three days and got off at the freeway in LA at 10 o'clock at night at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. It's the only address I'd ever heard of uh, and got out and it was pouring down raining and I just stared at the Capitol Records building and started to cry uh, knowing that I had arrived. This is where my future was going to be. When you were growing up, who, what was your favorite movie? If you could, and if you could have met any movie star before you got to Hollywood, who would you have said that's the person I want to meet? Oh my gosh! Uh, I'd already met Elvis because he had played the Clarksdale City Auditorium 
<laughs> That's a pretty big so deal, I, man. I was a kid. Of course, he was an Elvis, like Elvis is today, but he was Elvis nonetheless. Uh, but, you know, there was a beautiful actress named Janet Lee who was married to Tony Curtis. She was in Psycho. She was she was beautiful. I wanted to meet her. You know, there were so many movie stars uh, at that time, real movie stars, um, that uh, I was in awe of. And I, um, I wanted to meet them. You know... Clocks there where I came from, I, at midnight on a dirt road at the corner of Highway 61 and 49, Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to learn to play the guitar. And that's where the blues was born. And so was I. And I always thought that story was cool. You know, <laughs> it is a cool My story. Mother, she was tough. She wasn't impressed. She says, "No, Larry, you got to go to Hollywood. You got to meet important people." So, I was in search of important people. So, Larry, you get to the corner of Hollywood and Vine at ten o'clock at night. How do you get going in Hollywood? What's the first step? Well, when I got there, not only had I never been to California. I never met anybody that had been to <laughs> So, man, I was a yokel, you know. Um, I didn't know. Uh, I found a single apartment. I didn't, I, I didn't pay very much for it, I know that. And I started uh, following up on letters that I had sent out to law firms, um, a couple of studios to follow up to see if I could get a job interview. And I spent time doing that and walking around, you know, kicking rocks down the street, uh, trying to meet somebody or get a job somewhere. And uh, I was taking a course at uh, USC on the legal aspects of the entertainment business. Uh, and a guy from Capitol Records came there to lecture one night, and I asked a couple of stupid questions. And uh, and then after he left, I followed him out to his car, yanking on his pant leg. I said, <laughs> I'm Larry Thompson. Um, I'd like to work at Capitol Records or whatever. And I called this guy every week for, I don't know, three, four months. Sometimes he returned my call, sometimes he didn't. Uh, and I just kept bothering him. Uh, and finally one day he called me and said, Hey, uh, how are you coming on the California bar exam? I said, well, I'm taking it now. And he says, well, come on in. And if you pass, you can stay. So I said, great. So I started off at Capitol Records where I got out and cried. What is the coincidence of that? Do you remember what your starting salary at Capital was by any chance? I think it was $900 uh, a week. That's a lot of money back then. $900 a week? That was good. You, you, you know pay your rent. Was, well, I could barely do anything. Uh, but I was in the game. You know, I was in. That's all that counted. What was the first part of your responsibility at Capital when you got there? What were you working on? Uh, they would give me contracts to do a brief on, to summarize the contract into a couple of pages. Um, and I was spending my time learning contracts by briefing contracts. Uh, and then one day, it dawned on me that the president of the company, Sal Iannucci, got to work every day just about the same time, about 9 o'clock. And he would walk into the lobby, get on the elevator, and go up to the 13th floor. So I planned it that just so happened that I was about to get on the elevator at the same time he was in the morning. <laughs> so he'd walk around the corner, and I'd see him, and he'd go to the elevator, and I'd go to the elevator, and we'd get on the elevator together, and I'd say... 
Mr. Iannucci, my name is Larry Thompson. I'm from Clarksdale, Mississippi. I just came out here, and I just got a job in the legal department, and uh, blah, 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 blah. He'd look at me, shake his head, and the next day, he gets in the elevator. <laughs> Mr. Iannucci, I'm Larry Thompson. I'm from the legal department. I just came out here, and, you know, I love the Beatles, and blah, 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 blah. This went on for about a week and a half, maybe nine or ten days in. We walk on the elevator. Mr. Iannucci, I know your name is Larry Thompson. <laughs> I said, yeah. He says, come on up to my office. So I go up to his office with him, and I sit down, and he says, so, what kind of music do you like? I says, well, listen, you know, I... I respect the fact that Capitol has Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Al Martino and Peggy Lee, but the Beatles, who you guys distribute uh, through EMI and Apple in England, I love the Beatles, and I think that's where the music is going and blah, 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 blah. He says, okay, so he said, he buzzes Herb Karp, who was the legal counsel of Capitol. He says, Herb, come in here. I want you to meet somebody. So Herb Carp, he didn't even, Herb Carp didn't even know me. I was working in the legal department. So he says, look, I'm having difficulty when I go out at night trying to sign these new long-haired, dope-smoking songwriters, singers, because the lawyers you're sending me, you know, they're still out of touch. I want you to give this guy a crash course. I want, I want him to go with me in the A&R department when we go out to sign people. So Herb looked at me and I looked at her, but sure enough, they gave me a quick uh, tutorial. And next thing you know, I was out with the president of Capitol Records in the A&R department at night uh, talking to these managers and lawyers for these young kids, and I could relate to them. And we started signing a lot of uh, acts that were going in that direction. So, of course, everybody in the legal department was furious at me that I jumped over everybody and knew nothing. But it did happen. And uh, that's how I became known at Capitol and within the music business. And literally, almost two years later, uh, Sal called me in his office and said, hey, they're going to announce tomorrow that the Beatles are breaking up. And Thompson, I want you to sign four individual Beatles. I want four solo artists. I want four Beatles. And you're in charge of making sure that they all sign as individual artists uh, to Capitol. Well, that was a big assignment, and sure enough, in the next period of time, that's what I was doing, and I certainly made a name for myself then. And in fact, eventually got all four of them. Uh, to sign as individual artists. So that was a big deal no. and my first real break. Why did the Beatles break up? There's all kinds of speculation, but why did they break up and how did you use your insights into what was going on with the band to make sure that you could sign each of them as solo artists? Well, you know, they each were enormously gifted in their own way. And when they started as the Beatles, they were in sync as to what they were doing and where they were going. As each grew in their talent, they were going somewhat in different directions. And as in any band, you know, it got down to whose songs do you put on the album? Uh, who wrote this? Who wrote that? Um, different opinions because they became opinionated. They the more they the more you know, the more opinionated you become. And at some point their lives were moving in different directions and it was just natural for them to uh, want to do different things, do them differently. And uh it wasn't a horrible uh I mean it was horrible to the public because when we heard that the Beatles had broke up, I mean had you ever heard any worse news in your life? Uh, but for them, it was uh, freedom. It was freedom to explore uh, themselves, to explore what they wanted to do. And 
wouldn't you know that all four of them uh, became artists in their own right? Of course, a couple of them more so than others, uh, but they still wanted to record, they still wanted to sing, they still wanted to write. Uh, Capital had been a wonderful distributor to them through Apple, their company, through EMI, the England company, through Capital, the uh, subsidiary of EMI. So it, it was a natural thing. Uh, I'm not saying it didn't have problems. It, it did. When Paul McCartney delivered his first album, solo album, uh, they had not resolved their publishing agreement. That's their company called Northern Songs that administrated uh, the royalties earned from writing songs, not recording them, That's but writing. Paul and John, you mean? All four of them were signed to Northern. Oh, all four of them were Northern. Okay. Northern Songs. But, so the the publishing would have been split by Northern Songs four ways with the writer of each individual song. Well, when McCartney delivered his first album, he claimed that his wife, Linda Eastman, wrote all the songs. <laughs> A and dubious that, claim at best. Of course, the other three guys says, oh, not so fast. So here we were <laughs> trying to release Paul's first album, and he was maintaining that he didn't write any of the songs. So we had to work it out, basically, that we would release the album and the recording royalties would go to the four guys, but that, uh, or to, to Paul, uh, but that we would put the es uh, we put in escrow the uh, publishing monies, and once we had a musicologist uh, determine uh, who the writer <laughs> was, and of course it was Paul McCartney, uh, then everything got resolved. That was the first incident we ran into. And you maintained good relationships with uh, at least a couple of them over the years. You, you've got a great story about your George Harrison's first release. Well, yeah, George Harrison of the four uh, was certainly my favorite. Not that I didn't like all four because I did, but George Harrison was my favorite. And I think uh, the highlight or one of the memories that I have that I will never forget uh, is that when George had finished his first album called All Things Must Pass, he called me and said, Larry, I'm in town, and I want to deliver my first solo album, and uh, I'd like to play you a couple of things. Uh, can you meet me? Uh, I said, yeah, I can set up Studio A here at Capitol for you to come in. He said, yeah. I said, well, I should bring some people. No, he said, I just want you, and, and maybe bring somebody from the A&R department, and I said, great, come on in. So, uh, we're in studio, and in comes Paul, I mean, in comes George, and uh, he says, look, I'm going to play you something that I think is the single, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure, uh, it's different, but I'd like for you to take a listen. So I said, okay, so we're sitting there, and the music starts, and it's My Sweet Lord. I really want to love you. I really, uh, I mean, I never heard the Lord spoken in a rock and roll record, let alone Hari Krishna. He's singing Hari <laughs> Krishna, he's singing my Lord, and I'm going, oh my God. And he wants to know if this is the single. Well, it certainly was different. It was longer than most singles. He was singing a, a spiritual song, rock and roll. Well, they just blew me away. I can remember to this moment uh, sitting there looking at his face, looking at my face as I'm listening to my sweet Lord and knowing that uh, I was listening to history and I knew it. And when I think about it, this moment, it just gives me the shivers. Yeah, that was great. As it might. I just, I, th that story just blows me away. I love it. Uh, at some point, you went from being a, uh, a a lawyer for the label into personal talent management. Right. First of all, l l tell us the difference between what a talent manager does and what a talent agent does. Because those the civilians out here in the world who don't live in Hollywood 
might think those are kind of the same thing. Well, if you were going to build a house and you want to design it, uh, you'd go to an architect and you'd tell them, I want an English tutor home. And you'd go to the architect who specialized in English tutor. He would design it. Once you approve the design and you approve the cost, you'd hire a contractor to build it. Well, a manager is like a architect. We architect the career. Do you want to be a singer? Do you want to be a dancer? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to do comedy? Do you want to do drama? What is your talent? What is your persona? What career are we going to build? Because based on those decisions and psychoanalysts, uh, I then hire the agent whose job it is to secure employment for that career. I hire the lawyer who negotiates the contracts. I hire the publicity agent who does the publicity. So I oversee the career of the talent, bringing it all together. So when I go to an agent, you know, I said, look, we're looking for something along these lines, et cetera, et cetera. And then the agent goes out to solicit the employment. Of course, I help them as to whatever I can do about projects that are going on. So, you know, I decide with the talent, are you going to be a country and western singer? Are you going to be Brad Pitt? Uh, are you going to be what? And then let's form our career after what your real talent is. Not what you want to be yet, but who you really are. So as a manager, my job is to oversee everybody and to put together a team of people, including an agent, which I hire. You were getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Talent Managers Association, and Joan Rivers said this about you. It said this uh, to distinguish between agents and managers in tribute to you. Agents see you for what you do at the moment. Managers see you for what you could become. Are you good at seeing the potential in people? That's what I do. That's what I do for a living. I, I recognize the talent, and then I imagine how to market it, and then I nurture the talent to believe in themselves so that we can make real what we're dreaming. And it's, I mean, yes, I'm a good lawyer, uh, but I think that's my talent, actually. And what does it take to be successful? I mean, you've, you've written a book, and we don't need to go through every page of the book, but like, what, what are the broad strokes of what it takes to be successful in Hollywood? Well, you know, from over 250 stars now who I have represented, uh, I realize after studying them that the common denominator of their success uh, broke down into four things. And my book is about how you, no matter what you do, can be a star in your own career, whether it's a fireman, or whether it's a housewife, or whether it's a doctor, or whatever. What are the four elements of success that celebrities go through that are applicable to everybody's career? And they boil down to four things. One, you have to identify your talent. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have talent. Yeah, no, no. Everybody has talent. God gave everybody talent. You know, I don't have any talent. I mean, I know how to bake cookies or whatever. <laughs> and I thought, well, look, how about Famous Amos? That's all he could do was bake cookies. Uh, or Miss Fields, she knows how to bake cookies. That was their talent. Uh so everybody can do so. Well, some of my girlfriends ask me to do their hair all the time. Well, maybe you're a beautician. Open up a beauty shop. So you got to start asking yourself, what's my talent? So that's the first thing. You have to identify your talent. And in my book, I teach you how to investigate and ask yourself questions to come up with an answer for, for that. And the second thing is rage. You have to have a tunnel vision rage to succeed. Not a passion, not a hope, not a dream, not a wish, but you have to have rage, a tunnel vision, one-way ticket, no coming back. 
Who's the best example of that? Who had the most productive rage that you can think of? Well, look, certainly Oprah Winfrey had a lot of rage to succeed. Certainly Mel Gibson, to get The Passion of the Christ made, had a lot of rage to get it made. Uh, Those are two immediate examples of what I'm talking about. Talent, rage, the third thing is team. You got to put a team of people around you. If you know you're not good at something, you need to put somebody on your team that can help you in that area. And lastly, it's learn how to get lucky. Talent, rage, team, and luck. And in my book, I teach you how to be lucky. And it's teachable. Uh, And I go through examples uh, of what you can do. For example, there was a uh, a little course done where uh, on luck, where they had about 50 people in our classroom and they passed out a newspaper to all of them, uh, same newspaper. And they said, look, we want you to look through this newspaper uh, and tell us how many photos are in the paper. Uh, When you know how many there are, raise your hand. Passed out the papers. Go. People started opening up, counting. They're looking for the one. Some of them raised their hand. Later on, later on, finally, everybody raised their hand. Uh, But the people up front who raised their hand first Because on page three of this newspaper, it said there are 14 photos in this newspaper. (laughs) The rest of them were still looking for the photos to count. And the lesson learned is you can't be so focused on one thing that you lose sight of opportunities that are coming in. There was the answer right there on page three. There are 14. But if you're so, if your mind is locked into one thing, you don't see other things that are happening. So you learn to be lucky about being open to everything that's coming to you. So talent, rage, team, and luck are the four elements. The more talent you have, the less luck you need. The more rage you have, you know. It's a balance of those four things. A, a part of rage seems seems like it would contain knowing what you want. What do you think people want when they come to Hollywood? Fame, power, money? What is it? All of them. All of them. They want all those things. Uh, they want power. <laughs> they want fame. They want money. They want any and everything they can get. This is a place of excess. It's not normal. People come here with big dreams. Some of them have the ability to fulfill them. Most don't. Uh, And it's exciting. It may not be as crazy as Babylon, which is the new movie that's out right now. Uh, But uh, these people have dreams. Small town, big dreams. Hollywood provides a, a, a conduit to make it happen. Uh, they come out here looking at the Hollywood sign, uh, wanting to express themselves in whatever talent they have. You write in your book, you say you have to be careful about pursuing everything you want in life because you just might get it. What have you seen in your career that demonstrates the, the dangers of getting everything that you want? Well, it's like the dog who called the fire truck. <laughs> You know, he's running, he's running, he finally catches the fire truck and he's sitting there and he doesn't know what to do with the fire truck. That's when you get in trouble. And what do I mean by that? Um, There's a lot of roads to hell here that you can get in the limo and go down. So you have to be careful with... uh, Drugs, you have to be careful with alcohol, you have to be careful with uh, the opposite sex, you have to be careful with lying, you have to be careful because if you want something so bad, you know, sometimes you'll try to take a shortcut. 
And a lot of people do. And, and, and it costs them their career. You, you worked with a lot of young clients, a lot of young stars in, over, over the years. Did you ever sit down and specifically counsel them on that, those kinds of topics? All the time. I mean, that's part of the consultation. That's part of managing someone uh, is to uh, constantly guide them uh, on the right track, meeting the right people, working with the right people, not being seduced by what seems like a quick opportunity, uh, how to pass on opportunities that may be real but may not be good for you. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's walking through a quicksand. It's tough. How, how do you talk to a young person who sees you got to not, it's maybe somebody comes in and says, we're going to pay you millions of dollars to do this thing. And you look at it because you're not, you're one of the things they pay you for is an emotional psychological distance from that opportunity. How do you walk them through the process of evaluating whether or not they should take that? Well, if it's millions of dollars, I may not scrutinize it quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but normally that doesn't happen. Well, you know what I mean. It's all relative, right? <laughs> no, I mean, normally it's opportunities um, that require a sacrifice of some sort uh, that may not be prudent at all. And you just point that out. Uh, it's surprising that what might be obvious to me that would not be a good decision is not to someone who's young, inexperienced, and wants something more than anything in the whole world. Uh, and you have to sort of explain that to them. Jim Carrey has a famous quote. He said, I wish everybody could get rich and famous. So they would know that's not the answer. Do you think a lot of people go to Hollywood thinking that fame and money will, a will, will fix what ails them? I do. And I will say, fame and money does fix a lot of things. What does it fix? It fixed the desire within you to express your talent to make a lot of money, which is a confirmation of your talent. And fame is, in Hollywood, part of the perk or benefit that comes to talented people. So, if you're talented, you want to be known as talented and compensated. And so in any uh, field, you know, if you're working at a job and you want that promotion, you know, go for it, work for it. So you're always trying to improve yourself. The only difference is that uh, in Hollywood, everything is accelerated and fast and on a mega in public race. So you just turn up the heat on everything. Now, you worked with, and you tell the, the stories of working with some of the most famous people from my lifetime. Uh, you tell those stories in the book. Share, share some insights into the first time you saw Farrah Fawcett. Well, actually, it was at uh, Sonny and Cher's home. They were together at that time. I represented Sonny and Cher for many years. I represented Sonny and Cher. I represented Cher. I represented Sonny. I represented Sonny and Cher again. <laughs> I mean, all the things they were. I, but at this particular time, Sonny and Cher uh, were living in Bel Air, and uh, they were friends with. Uh, uh, Lee Majors, who was the six million dollar man at the time, sure, and on a very successful show, as were Sonny and Cher. And uh, I was representing Sonny and Cher. It was Thanksgiving. I was at the house, and um, Lee came and brought his new girlfriend, a girl from Texas named uh, Farrah. Farrah, I never heard that name before. But she was a knockout blonde. <laughs> and uh, she, the only thing she had done at that time, she had done a commercial for a shaving cream uh, with Joe Namath called Great Balls of Comfort, I think is what it was. And uh, she wanted to break into the business. So at the same time, a buddy of mine was at lunch also named Jay Bernstein, who was a publicist, PR guy. Of course, I was trying to sign Lee as a management client. 
Uh, you have to be careful of that while you're around another management client, Sonny and Cher. But, uh, and uh, Lee needed a publicist. So he said, he said to uh, Jay, he said, look, Jay, I'll sign with you as a publicist and I'll work with you and Larry, uh, but you got to take on my girlfriend free. I'll pay you the normal rate, but you got to take her on free. Okay. Well, my <laughs> Lord. The, we never knew that that, that was the star. And, um, and that success was pretty meteoric and uh, how that happened. She was uh, quite beautiful. She was quite unique. Uh, everything about her was special. Of course, she became a huge star. Six million dollar man got canceled. Life goes on. Yeah. You tell this story in a book about a time in your life when your career got very complicated. And for the first time in your life, you went to see a therapist. What happened on the way to see that therapist? Well, you know, as I said earlier, uh, you can get into a lot of traps out of here. And... Uh, I had a great deal of success, bought a studio, was representing talent. I was making movies. Everything was going good. But, you know, it, it wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it would be. One night I'm in a restaurant having, a dinner, having dinner with this executive at CBS. And while I was talking to her at dinner, I felt my foot underneath the table starting to shake. But I was calm, but my foot, next thing I know, both feet were shaking. But when I looked down there, they were still as they could be, but I could feel them shaking. Next thing you know, I felt my arm flailing and this arm flailing. I felt like this, but when I, but nothing was moving. So I got up, excuse myself, I was pitching a project at the time, and I went to the restroom. The restaurant was Morton's. Uh, and while I'm in there, I just looked in the mirror and said, Larry, you got to calm, calm down. You know, um, Immediately when the dinner was over and I didn't offer dessert, we got out of there as fast as we could. I drove to the emergency room at Cedar Sinai saying something is wrong with me. They, they said, we've checked everything. There's nothing wrong with you. So my doctor finally got to the emergency room. He said, Larry, they can't find anything wrong with you. He says, have you been under stress? Stress, that's what I do for a living, stress. I, I think on everybody's stress. Of course I'm under, under stress. He said, but any unusual stress? I says, I don't know. I'm thinking about selling the studio. I'm going through a divorce. I'm breaking up my partnership with Jay Bernstein. Um, yeah, I'm under stress. He said, well, I think you need to see someone. And I said, who? He says, a therapist. I said, a therapist? I don't see therapists. That's what my clients do. I'm their therapist. I don't go to therapists. He said, I think you should see someone. So I, he gave me a card with a guy's name on it. I was staying at a hotel at the time because I'd moved out of my house going through a divorce. I was under stress. And uh, I went back to the hotel room to order dinner from the menu and I had the menu in front of me and I was looking down to order and uh, next thing I know it was about 8 o'clock in the morning and I still had the menu in front of me and had decided what I wanted to eat. Now I had made all these decisions during the day but I couldn't decide what to eat. So I said something is wrong. So I make an appointment with this psychiatrist. I called him and I said, can you see me? He said, well look in my book here, I can see you in a couple of weeks. No, not a couple of weeks. I need to see you now. He <laughs> says, well why don't you get here about seven? I'll stay an extra hour and uh, I'll meet you. I said, great. So I'm driving to his uh, office. I'm driving a white Rolls Royce Corniche convertible that I had bought from Barry Manilow. No kidding. Yeah, with red interior. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm driving this car to the psychiatrist. Big shot on a studio, all these stars around. Everything I'd wanted when I left Mississippi. Everything I wanted, I had. Driving there. But I was 
losing my mind. I was going crazy. So I get out of the car, and as soon as I step out of the car on the street, two guys jump me with sawed-off shotguns pointing to my head. Put your hands up in the air, mother, while I blow it off. They didn't know that that would have been the best thing that could happen to because my head was hurting so bad from what I was going through. That would have been relief that I was looking for. But I said to him, hey, look, look, you want some money? I had about $800 on me and a Rolex watch. I said, here, here's a Rolex watch. You know, give me the keys to your car. I said, okay, but you guys aren't going to get very far driving a white... <laughs> A uh, Cornish convertible. Uh, hey, that's Barry Manilow's car. Yeah. <laughs> I said, why don't you give me my keys back? You take the money. You take the Rolex watch. I won't report this. He said, turn around. Turn around. There's a tree. He said, kneel down and put your hands up on the tree, uh, which I did. They had the shotgun in the back of my head. I said, count from 100 backwards. So I go, 99, 98, 97. By the time I get to 93, I hear them run off. I go into the therapist's office for my session, my first session, and I start talking. So at the end of the session, after an hour, when I'm about to leave, the therapist says, wait a minute, let me check my phone. Uh, before we leave, and I will, we'll walk out together. I said, okay. So he checks his phone, and he comes back out, and he said, did you see anything unusual when you came here? I said, like what? I don't know, maybe like somebody on a holdup, somebody outside, uh, a couple of guys with a gun holding up something. I said, oh, that was me. He said, you were held up at gunpoint in front of my office, came in here and talked to me for an hour and you never told me that? I said, well, look, that was history. That, that's gone. Nothing happened there. I got real problems. Not that. <laughs> well, that started my therapy session uh, and uh, it took me a while to put in order uh, my wishes, my desires, my longings, what was, what was important, not important. And... Uh, so when I give advice to creative, talented people who need, who want, I, I come from a place that I get it, you know. And years later, in Clarksdale, Mississippi, my hometown, where my mom and dad still were, uh, the old Paramount Theater was converted to the Larry Thompson Center for Fine Arts. And I went down there for this ceremony and the, for the fundraising and I took with me uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, and Donna Mills from Knott's Landing, and Alex Haley, who had written Roots. Some talented people for the ceremony at the Clarksdale City Auditorium, where I met Elvis as a kid. And uh, in the course of the evening, uh, when I spoke for the dedication, I asked my mom and dad to stand up and I introduced them as the most important people in the world that I'd ever met. Uh, so I learned everything full circle. So let's talk about those two buckets, important, not important. Obviously your mom and dad were in the important bucket. What else is in that and what's in the other one? Buckets meaning? Meaning if you're going to categorize things in your life as important or unimportant in two separate buckets that, and, and that you got clarity on that through therapy, what did you see that was, was, was important that you weren't prioritizing before and vice versa? Well, I think, as a, again, I'm talking about my mother today. I, I feel like I'm in a psychiatric session here. But um, uh, my mother's uh, a take on what I went through was that I was so focused on going up, achieving. I mean, to go from Clarksdale, Mississippi with $700 to buying a studio, to representing all these stars, to making movies, all the things that were going on, man, I was on a trajectory of going up. But 
success isn't not only about the height you reach, but about the depth and width that you build yourself on. And I had built myself straight up and failed to develop my depth and my width so that I could stand straight. So, you know, the night that I got held up, I sort of toppled over. So I think that you have to do everything in moderation. You have to do it in balance. You have to know who you are to begin with. You have to learn who you're growing into. You have to... Uh, be a good person. You have to just think about it all, you know. Uh, be careful what you wish for. You can get it. You can get it, you know, but you want to get it a way that you can keep it forever. And those are the other buckets that I had to learn. So after all this time is achieving all the success you achieved, do you feel rich? Yes, I do. I, am, I, I feel blessed. I don't think this could happen without some force other than me. You know, I, I, I've had some divine guidance, uh, things that I can do. I realize it ain't about old Larry here. I'm sort of a, <laughs> a vehicle or a vessel that things are coming through. I don't mean to get nuts here on you, but... Uh, no, that's why we're. That's why we do this. But it it it, it takes a while uh, to grow into who you are, and it takes an open mind and the ability to take risks to become who you can be. Being an, an actor, a star, you know. Today, you look at a Margot Robbie, or you look at a Brad Pitt, or you look at. Uh, a Tom Cruise, or you look at whomever, uh, it's not about just going out there and doing your thing. You know, they have to work hard uh, at what they go through and went through, and they learn how to harness their talent. Like, it's just like a horse. A horse may be out there, but you got to learn how to get on it. You have to tame it. You have to learn how to ride it. You have to uh, harness, control, uh, guide, uh, do a lot of things. And by the way, that's true, again, in anything you do. Uh, like I said, some people have all the talent in the world and don't have to do this, and some people have uh, only luck on their side, but does that last long? So finding a manager, which is what I do, to help you think through this and guide you is a very important thing. Very important thing. And you, and you have to really want it in the beginning. So I, I know I'm talking out of two sides of my mouth. And that one, I'm saying you have to really want it. And at the other time, I'm saying you got to be careful about what you want. You know, when I left Capitol and I started a law firm initially, Thompson, Shaman, Bond, and Moss, and we were representing a lot of talented people at that time, uh, I'd gotten a call uh, from a friend of mine at Ole Miss, who I'd gone to school with, and he says, I got a buddy out there. He's going to call you. I told him you negotiated the Beatles thing. You know, he's going to give you a call. I said, okay. Normally I get those calls and I never hear from anybody. So one day I'm coming back from lunch at my office on Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. And I see in the reception room, there's a guy sitting on the floor. Big, big, heavy set black gentleman. And he had on a gray old overcoat and bedroom slippers. Wild hair. He said, you Mr. Thompson? I said, yes, I am. He says, I need a lawyer. I need you to represent me. I said, would well, you have an appointment? He says, no, but I know Billy gave you a call, told you I was going to give you a call. Uh, I, I need a lawyer. I need a lawyer. I, I want you to represent. I hear you're the best lawyer, uh, record lawyer in Hollywood. You negotiate the Beatles. You negotiate. You represent everybody. I... I need you as my lawyer. So he stood up. I said, well, you know, you need at least $500 to open up a file here at the law firm. He said, Mr. Thompson, the only thing I have of value in my life is on this tape. I've recorded an album. It's not finished, but I've recorded it. I'm going to leave this tape here with you. I'm going to go get $500. Do 
and I'm going to be back, and you're going to be my lawyer. I said, okay. So, I went inside. A few days later, he comes back. He had walked from South Central L.A. to Sunset Boulevard in his bedroom slippers, stolen a fried chicken out of a lamped convenience store, eaten the fried chicken, and walked in with the grease still on his hand, five wadded up $100 bills. And he says, you're my lawyer. By then, I had listened to the tape. And for the first time, again, I heard the melodious tone of Barry White singing. Uh, that, the Barry White tunes. Uh, I can hear it right now in my mind. And... Uh, I said, Barry, hell, now, once I heard your music, I would have given you the $500. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how, I, how great it was. Um, now you got, a, you got endorsement from somebody on Barry White pretty early. Well, yeah, I then took the, uh, the, uh, the tape to Russ Reagan at 20th Century Records at the time to see if they wanted to make a, a deal with uh with Barry. And it was unusual. It wasn't something that just jumped off. It was a whole different sound like you never heard before. So uh, Russ says, well, let me think about it. So it was around Christmas time and he was having a Christmas party at 20th Century Records for different talents and their roster, et cetera, et cetera. So he had the, the tape playing in his office while the Christmas party was going on. So uh, Elton John was at the party. So Elton goes in Russ's office and he sits down and he's listening to this tape. So he says, Russ, who's this? He said, oh, that's a tape on a guy that uh, Larry brought me to take a look at. I'm not sure. He said, not sure. He said, this is unbelievable. <laughs> he signed this guy. Sure enough, Russ called me. They signed Barry White and that was the beginning of Love Unlimited, and everything that was Barry White. Platinum, platinum, platinum. Disco, we opened up every disco around the world. Regines in Paris to South America. He started a whole sound, and it was just beautiful. You're my first, my last, my everything. One of my favorite songs. I guess he didn't have to walk from Compton to Hollywood very much after that. Nah, and he got some real shoes, too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you go in a second, but lastly, I need to know, why does the world love William Shatner? You know, they do. Let me say that, because I have represented him for 41 years. I have represented William Shatner 41 years. He's my friend, he's my buddy, he's my client. Sometimes we fight like old couple. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, he's gifted. He is, uh, he's got a talent. He has a sense of curiosity about everything that never ends. He works hard. Uh, he loves life. Uh, and he never can get enough of it. I mean, he's, I think, 83 now, and uh, he's got more energy than me between riding his horses and going into space. That <laughs> Jeff Bezos sent him up in space. He's back, and, you know, he's, uh, he's seen it all. As, ba as Barry White once told me, he's seen all 380 degrees. I kept thinking, I thought there was only 360 degrees. So Barry White <laughs> got 40 degrees more than I did, and I think William Shatner sees 390 degrees. I mean, he's a unique 
talent. He's a unique individual. Uh, he's charismatic. He is boldly gone where no man has gone. He's, I've been blessed to call him a friend. Larry, it's really been a pleasure talking to you, and I appreciate you sharing not just anecdotes about the stars you've worked with, but insights from your own personal journey. So thank you. Larry Thompson is the author of the book, Shine, A Powerful Four-Step Plan for Becoming a Star in Anything You Do. Once again, thank you, Larry. And I hope to see all your listeners on Life's Red Carpet. Hey, everybody. Thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. I knew you would enjoy Larry's anecdotes and approach to life as much as I did. Um... I could listen to it for another three hours. I wish I could hear all the stories he had to tell. Alas. Hey, you know, folks, in the production of a podcast, there are occasional times when you have production slip-ups and uh, you you throw yourself at the, <laughs> at the feet of the guest uh, and beg their forgiveness. And we did have some hiccups in the original production of this episode. So I want to send a very special thanks uh, to Larry and his assistant, Robert, for being uh, quite gracious, quite patient, and gentlemanly with, uh, with, with us, the producers here at Crazy Money. We greatly appreciate you making the time to make sure this was as good a podcast episode as it possibly could be. Certainly your, your story and your insights merit the kind of production that we got out of this. So thanks. All right, everybody, the takeaways from this week's episode will be shot on video and posted to the Crazy Money Instagram group and the Crazy Money uh, Facebook page, the Crazy Money Podcast Listeners Group on Facebook. So check them out there. Lastly, I want to uh, I want to beseech you to subscribe to my Substack. That is paulollinger.substack.com. That is bi-weekly essays from yours truly on money and the meaning of life uh, and things, assorted things that piss me off. Uh, on there, you have the opportunity to subscribe as a free subscriber or a premium subscriber for which you will get some limited edition crazy money swag. So consider doing that. Help me subsidize the production of crazy money on which I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars over the past four years. I'm not going to go broke. No, but I just don't want to lose money making this thing. And I hope you enjoyed enough to throw a few bucks at it so I can pay Mike Carano the millions of dollars he deserves for editing this podcast. In the meantime, Mike Carano made me sound smart.